the Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to it. Weekend editions here. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, and Elijah Herbal. Hope you're doing all right. It's championship Saturday in Nebraska. The boys' state basketball championships commence at PBA. That gets going at 9 a.m. Central and a full day of hoops, which is great. And then... Uh, On to the madness, or the madness continues with uh, one final regular season game, Nebraska-Michigan Big Ten Tournament, presumed NCAA tournament dance, uh, dance card being punched for Nebraska basketball, men's and women's, and then uh, spring football is not far away. It's uh, coming up here the 24th of March as it gets going. As we uh, we rock and roll here, and oh. a uh, happy heavenly birthday to one of our favorites, Mike Leach, today. Oh. Uh, really good story uh, out in ESPN. Ryan McGee put it together, uh, rem- recalling some of his trips and times with uh, the pirate as he would uh, catch up with him down in Key West. So there is that. But guys, it's it's been a Interesting week. There's been some discussions here, more on the college football playoff, more backlash about some of those auto bids. And you've got the commissioners right now, at least the SEC commissioner, complaining a little bit about not only the backlash, but just the fact that they're wasting time right now. Greg Sankey frustrated over the college football playoff discussions. Why wasn't this discussed earlier? You've got some backlash about the the fact there's uh, auto bids and from a revenue di- distribution standpoint, you want 80% of it, 60% of it going to the Big Ten or the SEC. I don't disagree because they will be giving you the teams you're going to want to watch. But as I look at this playoff model, make it like the NFL. Absolutely. Give me give me um, your, your, your best – six or seven and more can be better and uh there's there's money to be had i just if i'm a nebraska football fan what's that window what's that timeline getting up to speed to being a a playoff contender and i'm anxious to see this year i can't wait for spring football and i think nebraska is going to be at a good spot also have mitch sherman's story his sit down his one-on-one with tony why it's really cool Hmm. and uh Oscar baseball had a uh, come to Jesus last night as South Alabama said 38 degrees. We don't care. They, uh, they rolled last night in Lincoln. We'll see how the, the Huskers bounce back, back this weekend. Elijah, you still have your shirt on. Great. Apparently poker went okay last night. Yeah. No. Next, next question. Yeah. <laughs> Next Craig, Nack, how are you? How are you? What did you do last night? UNO hockey. They were oh, playing. Nice. Yeah, they're they're playing North Dakota, and it's mm-hmm. the uh, just a little setup. I knew none of this information before yesterday, so I'm not trying to sound like an expert. But final Keep weekend, sounding. final weekend of the regular season. North Dakota, number three in the country, number one in the conference. Right, mm-hmm. far and away, they they clinched the conference last year. North Dakota and UNO, they're rivals. Yeah. Did you know that? That's their rival. I didn't know that that was their rival, though. Did you know that? I had a suspicion. I suspect it's one of those things where it's like UNO's rival, but North Dakota doesn't necessarily think of you as the rival, but kind of Colorado, does. Colorado, Nebraska. Basically. Mm-hmm. Like, like North Dakota doesn't want to admit it, but it is, you know, kind of thing. Uh, three to two, UNO wins. And that's important because if they finish in the top four, then they get to host in the playoffs. Uh, Because they have, you know, conference tournament, essentially conference playoffs. And then uh, and then they're kind of in better position for an at large bid. So they they won it three to two. It was was pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. Every time you go to a hockey game, aren't you kind of like, I I should I wish I liked I wish I got into hockey more. I wish I followed it more. 
But there's so I much did... crap I don't understand. I just don't understand. Uh, what? You want some help? Yeah. What, what do you Is that what we're going to do this morning? We're yeah, going to do hockey lessons? Mark, still don't, still well, don't understand icing. We, we, still we, don't understand well, icing. It's, it's kind of like, uh, well, icing is, uh, you know what it is, but mm. why is it a rule, right? We got to ask the iron horse, Gary Sharp, oh, when dude. he makes his appearance because Sharpie's Mr. Hockey. Do, he knows do, a ton about hockey. Do you think hockey. people realize how oh, good of a play-by-play hockey guy Gary is? He I is. Hope, I hope they do. I hope they realize up. How I'm good not, he is at everything. Oh, he's good at he's good he's good at everything. But I'm telling you, in the hockey in particular, he's a phenom. He's he's ridiculous. Well, it so should be good. noted we just got a text in from Gary Sharp that he is unable uh, to get onto the internet in Sioux Falls this morning. No, I take inter- everything back. No, I take everything access. I just said. We are not going to be able to speak with Gary Sharp this morning, unfortunately. I, I, I take, him if, I take if, everything if back. Wants, I just said if he wants to uh, to do a phoner. <laughs> like, like you know, five years ago. I remember we those. We can do that. I remember those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll dive in. Uh, excited yeah. to have you. Brandon Vogel's going to join us. Time to do our, our roll call, our shout-outs, our starting five. NASCAR Eric has checked in. He is in at number one. I almost put on that shirt again today. It's you hanging. I, I'm going right. to put it on again. All right. Yeah. Drunk Monk has come in at second. Moonbot, seven. Uh, is in at third. Uh, Walter pleads the fifth. <laughs> wow. Like it. Uh, Mark Lund. He's Mr. Houston, Texas real estate. Hey, now. Good for you, Mark I- Lund. Good to mm. have you. Rick says hi. Andrew says what's up. Brendan from the Black Hills is joining us this morning, the Friday, make that the Saturday morning after his Friday night bachelor party. Started in Sioux Falls. Patrick, Brian, uh, Mark Cranach is in. Uh, Doug says hi. Trapped in SEC country also checks in. So we do need to, to, to make a statement here from, for, for uh, Brennan from the Black Hills, guys. Brennan says, morning, <laughs> fellas. I've been instructed by the future Mrs. Black Hills Brennan that I might have to fight Clausburn. And and we no have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, there. well, let us set this up for Cranach. Well, yeah. Brennan uh, joined us on the Friday forecast. You've done that before, Cranach, where you make your predictions. You've done a Friday show or two in your life yeah. where we where we pick. Sure. And, and I'm and, familiar with Clausburn, of course. Right, right. And what we did do is we had Brennan join us, and we might start having a listener join us, a listener or streamer join us on the uh, YouTube page while we're doing the forecast moving forward. We've mm. been arm wrestling with that. Going to be fun. Okay. But um, Clausburn made a comment in his backhanded way of congratulating Brennan about you know being engaged and getting married. Mm. Something about getting the the milk for free, Elijah. What is the <laughs> yeah? It was saying? Uh, well, I buy the cow when you can get the milk for free, right? Yeah, uh, it yeah. was and, something along those lines. He said you must not have been getting the milk for free if you're going to end up buying the cow. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, wow. And Mrs. Black Hills Brandon is awesome. And if uh, I, uh, I, I just you know. Claws is good stuff, but yeah, Bre- Brennan's got his instructions. <laughs> so we'll see how that how that goes. So, what uh, what's the feel for you guys as we get back to some football thoughts uh, on the uh, the Friday night football? And I, I bring this up because it's it's a new reality. Fox lost WWE. So they are going to rotate what they have property-wise, which is the Mountain West, which is the Big 12, which has been Big Ten football. So it may be three, three Big Ten games a season, but they're going to do Friday night football again. They plan Mm -hmm. on having an opportunity to do – As soon as this year too, right? Yeah. Like this year. Yeah. And we don't don't have – well, when when you have your – uh, 12 team era, okay, of, of playoff football. What do you, 
allow if you're Tony Petiti? Do you allow Ohio State and Penn State and who else to say, no, we're not doing Friday night football? Because they, they just flat out said no in past years. Hmm. And Nebraska has played a few of them. And Nebraska already plays Friday. They play the um, – Iowa. Yeah. They play Iowa on Black Friday. So it's not like they don't participate. Yeah. That's a little different deal. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm interested to get your take on this because I see it, and the Pac-12 is kind of used to it. I mean, you've had some really great ball games on Friday nights, either Pac-12 after dark on a Friday night ESPN ball game or your Pac-12 championship game's been, been a, uh, a Friday night affair anyway. We bring in Brandon Vogel with Counter Reed, counterreed.com. Folks, do you have bacon frying in the background, or am I just hearing things? Um, I think you're just hearing things. No, mm-hmm. no bacon frying in the in the office, unfortunately. Ah, be Chris, nice to have a bacon fasting? station here. Yeah. Is have there you been a, fasting, Chris? You're even, starting to imagine. I, I kind of hear what Chris is hearing. That it's like oh, maybe it's a, a small fire crackling away in the corner. Um, I'm not sure. You hear some. You, you hear some sizzle. You hear some sizzle. A little, yeah. Maybe that's just the hot takes that Brandon's about to bring. Maybe, huh? It's Maybe that's true. it. It's true. Maybe that's it. <laughs> Never know. Never know. Vogue's Friday Night Football. Does Nebraska get punched in the face on this endeavor yet again? Or how do you see the Big Ten navigating it moving forward? Do you stick it all with the La La schools because they do it anyway? They've been doing uh, it anyway. <laughs> well, I, I – Nebraska as still a a relative name brand uh, who is one of the big 10 schools who will agree to play on Friday nights. Yeah. I think, I think they'll still end up showing there, you know, when, when Michigan and Ohio state, uh, well, Ohio state, I think has played road games on Friday, although that's all Nebraska's played at this point. But I think from, you know, hearing from Trev Alberts at times, like Nebraska would be willing to try maybe a Friday home game, which is is interesting uh, when you just think of like everything it takes to pull off a Saturday in Lincoln. Like mm-hmm. trying to do it on a Friday is is tough. So yeah, I think I think Nebraska uh, is is willing to play those games on Friday. So they'll be they'll be in the rotation. Hmm. Do you think that's? Do you think that can? Is that a? If Nebraska achieves Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan status. If you're, if you're a contender, do, do, do you think that continues or is this Trev's take d- during Nebraska's presumed climb? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a I, I don't think it automatically, I don't think it automatically goes away if, you know, Nebraska wins the 2024 national title and it's Michigan now all of a sudden. Um, but I, I do think there's part of it of like, hey, if these other programs are, you know, not willing to do this like are you giving yourself a little bit of an edge uh at a time when you you probably need a little bit of an edge that isn't there traditionally but even beyond that i think it still could be like if if you're willing and those those friday games are end up being a a decent showcase for you uh why not keep playing them and particularly if some of your other rivals are are just simply unwilling to Hmm. do you guys have a problem with thursday night games back in the day i kind of loved those I love Thursday night on ESPN, and Nebraska was really good, and it had the whole world do itself, even though there was infancy in in TV. You could be on more than twice a year, but you'd you'd get an Okie State or Southern Miss or a K-State. I mean, Taylor Martinez set the world on fire, and Nebraska looked really good. It really was a pretty big-time enhancer for you if you had a – Big time wow win for your for your program. And Friday forward. nights are not that. Friday nights are not that. They're not. They're not. No. That's why I brought it up. They're not no. what no. Thursdays were. No. But the NFL dominates, so everything's kind of going into that NFL model between the playoff, between expansion vogues, and now you get to um, this idea for Friday night football. Once in a while, the NFL will shift back to Saturday. They do that as you get – deeper in but it usually doesn't cross over with your college football because it's that window between your your bowl season and uh it's after your regular season yeah 
Nebraska, how many Thursday? Because they haven't done, they haven't hosted a Friday game. I know in the past there was the occasional Thursday game, although I can't. Other than that, Who that Rice game it was in two thousand one, which got moved. You know, for for obvious reasons. Um, mm-hmm. Was that a Thursday game? Uh, it was, you know, but I, 20, yeah. 2010, 2010, I think. Yeah, twenty ten was the last Thursday game they did. That was at Kansas State. No, nope, yeah, maybe, that's, yeah, twenty ten. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the you know when you know the stadium's going to be sold out every time, and you're going to be bringing eighty to ninety thousand people in. It's just really hard to do that on a on a weekday. So, um, I mean, I'm <laughs> I have my preference, and I think for Nebraska, certainly um, Saturdays is is where you want them to be. That said, I'm, I'm kind of a, a junkie, and I will I will watch I will watch football whatever night it is on if I'm if I'm able to. So it doesn't make all that much difference to me. And that's the thing to me, Brandon. The, the one thing that sticks in my craw here is maybe I'm too much of a traditionalist, but I always thought Saturday and Sunday were for watching football, especially during the fall. You get college on Saturday, NFL on Sunday. You can pick your poison if you'd like. Monday, you get the NFL showcase. Hey, you made it through Monday. Congrats. Here's a football game. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are for you know, spending time with the wife and the kids, uh, making sure they're well taken care of. Friday then is like a nice, like you get a family outing. Maybe it's to a high school football game. Those are available. Maybe you go see a movie. And if you have football every single night, it's just taking away time from the wife and kids, in my humble opinion. Saying that as somebody who has no wife and no kids. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm just too, too old-fashioned with this, but I don't think we need football seven days a week. I, I mean, in a, in a, in a What's perfect- wrong with you? In a perfect, perfect world, white picket fences. I, I, I would agree with you. I mean, that's part of the reason uh, I've, I've largely left the NFL behind because you got to take, you got to take a day off somewhere, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but it's you know, the, the Thursday night football thing's been going on so long that like at this point, if there's if there's not a, a very good game on Thursdays, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. Um, so I've, I've definitely become conditioned as, as somebody who watches college almost exclusively to, to watch football on those days. But yeah, there's, there's something, there's something nice and, uh, somewhat romantic about it just being Saturdays, right? Like a, like a bygone era. Yep. Yep. Brandon Vogel's with us from counter read, counter read.com Vogue's, uh, let's spend a minute here as uh, we talk about spring football around the corner. What do you think the biggest question going in to spring football is for Nebraska? What's the biggest question coming out that needs to be answered for spring football for Nebraska? Um, I mean, I think it's it's tough to get around. It's tough to get around who's going to be the quarterback of this team, um, given a lot of the other things that I think are in place. I think more broadly, just what it, what does this offense look like? It's capable of doing after five weeks of spring ball and you know you won't know um but you'll get you'll get a progress report the only progress report that's available until they start playing actual games that that count in the standings so i think i think most of the questions are are over there on that side um defensively you've got a good sense of of what you've got coming back but it's you know a a thought that i kind of had this week like just looking at some of the content that Nebraska's put out from its its workouts, like defensively, we can kind of look at, you know, we talked about this a little bit on the show last week about Ty Robinson, Nash Hutmacher, some of those guys who you expect to be uh, your, your top level players. It gets interesting on defense when you start looking at guys like Cameron Linhart or, or some of those younger guys who like showed some flashes, I think, in, in 2023, more than flashes in some case, like, who are, who are those guys on defense because it's a little more established. That's kind of that second level down where you're like, oh, I think this, this could be, if things go well, like this, this is a future all, all conference pick. Um, I think Nebraska has a handful of those guys defensively. Um, so hmm. kind of watching, watching through that lens, I think defensively might be my primary angle of if intrigue there. Okay. Let's, let's do some naming and some prognosticating there. Let's take the Nashes and the ties off the table, right? The established mm-hmm. guys that are in the running this year for, for all conference type stuff. But you allude to Cam Linhart. 
Prince uh, Uman Yellen, folks like that. Let's name a few of those. Who who are those ones that you think, given the scheme? And wow, how about this light? If you're watching this thing, if you're watching, you look YouTube, heavenly. You look <laughs> heavenly. I'm, I'm like being backcast by this heavenly light. This is ridiculous. Anyway, so I'm going to duck down a little. Um, but you got Prince. You got Cam. And is it in particular along the defensive line that you're most bullish uh, on the future guys or second level or third? Um, I, I think there's, there's a couple of second level guys. Um, Javen Wright ended up third on the team in tackles, you know, um, that's a guy who I feel like has, is, is still fairly early in, in what looks like a, an upward trajectory. Wait, third, um, third. Butler would, would be, would be another one. Um, so I think, I think there's, there's some, and then, you know, in the secondary, you're, you're a little bit more set. Um, Isaac Gifford probably more squarely belongs in, uh the the robinson hutmacher category but he's a guy who i think i would expect to have a really big season um even though he's had some really big seasons lately biggest my guy uh, i'm circling singleton yep. i mean that's who i think is is gonna be your your second level him and gif are nice i'm pretty anxious to see where the linebacking crew goes bayer had some nice moments. You mentioned Wright is that hybrid. That's a really nice option. The kid out of Syracuse, I think, could be a monster wow factor uh, that transferred in. Help Stephon, me out, Stephon here. Thompson. Uh, yeah, Tom, yeah, Stephon. I think will will be very really nice. talk about him so far though. It's that's interesting. I'm glad you brought him up. He's kind of been because, forgotten. Well, yeah. it, it just it just fits too well, doesn't it? With how well he played as a freshman under Tony White and he transferred to come be back with Tony White yeah. at that middle level. But Unique I think Nebraska is, yeah. yeah, I think Nebraska's I mean sideline to sideline ability is wonderful. And you had two big dudes up front that aren't supposed to let you get through <laughs> or at least clog it up so your linebackers can fill. So go ahead, Elijah. I just jumped in there. Sorry. But no, I mean I, I think there's a lot of candidates and I think they could be we were talking to Dolman yesterday. He thinks Nebraska could be the best defense in the Big Ten. Whew. And I, th- that was the question I was going to kind of ask is with, with that in mind, with Nebraska's ceiling in mind on that defensive side of the ball, how intriguing of a spring is it truly in terms of position battles? Like we Dolman talked yesterday about some of the uh, the transfer battles, guys that are trying to be fighting for playing time through the spring. And if you know they don't end up on the depth chart where they'd like, might end up hitting the transfer portal. But the question to me was how many spots realistically are, are there on the defense that are up for grabs here through this spring? I think of the corner spot opposite Tommy Hill. That one's kind of up for grabs. Uh, maybe a safety spot. You kind of pencil oh, Singleton in, assuming he comes back from that knee injury well into one of the safety spots. And then elsewhere, you kind of are, are set aside from some backup roles or rotation roles. The defense is kind of set in what they're going to be. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think I think for that reason, the spring really is um, maybe more than position battles, which which will kind of sort themselves out because um, there's not a lot of spots where you just point to and say, well, yeah, you got you need a guy there uh, who 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 wasn't who's who's not here from last year. It's about kind of developing the depth. Like, and it'll be tough to tell. We won't see enough of of spring football, but like it would be interesting to know once you come out of it. Okay. How many, how many defenders do you have that you're like, yeah, we could play all 34 of these guys right now. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to do. I think, I think Nebraska's in a unique spot. Will they be the best defense in the big 10? I mean, they've got the experience returning to, to be in that discussion. I mean, you just, you, you look at a, a school like Iowa, it kind of doesn't matter who they, who they lose or return. Um, Cooper DeGene is certainly a, a big loss. Like that, that's just, you just put them they're they're one, two or three in, in the big 10 defensively every year. And I think that's, that's fair to say, can Nebraska be that good? I mean, they only gave up 18 points last year. Um, so we'll, yeah. we'll see what another year in the system does. Well, and there's a lot of room for a lot of guys, too. You, last year, 17 guys recorded at least a half sack. Like, say that again. 17 dudes, right? 20 guys with double-digit tackles or more. Um, and I think you bring back about 16 of those 20. <laughs> so, you know, kind of to your point, 
a lot of stuff is set, Elijah, but there's also room. Tony White intentionally brings in, he, he wants to go too deep, even three in some cases. They have roles. I mean, you saw 25 guys, and this has probably been dropped while I was letting the peps out, but I mean, you had 25 guys play meaningful snaps against Minnesota mm-hmm. a year ago, right? So you're going to find a role, and you're going to find a different matchup that your role may thrive in, mm-hmm. and that's what's so cool about what Nebraska's defense can be, and you're going to need to be multiple, right? because of how diverse the Big Ten now is. It's not just Wisconsin and Iowa in a phone booth. <laughs> it's Oregon, it's USC, it's spread, it's pro style, it's whatever, right? So find guys that can can fit all of it and and have very good depth with it. So that's what's really cool. And a lot's been talked about too, Vogues, with Nebraska – and uh, just this second year, the kind of tweaks. Tony White's been, I don't want to say losing sleep, but going nuts on the third down. Nebraska ranked right around 50th in third down defensive conversions. And I loved watching that defense last year, but if there is one complaint, it was about third and eight. (laughs) It was third and eight or third and 12, and there's a 15-yard dig route first down. I mean, there's just a handful of third downs that really kind of broke Nebraska's back. Defense could be great about 90% of the time, but there's two drives that you can't have the opponent score on you, and Nebraska just didn't get off the field. Yeah, and I mean, and that's that's kind of a, a, a good a good problem to have uh, coming off the season that Nebraska had defensively with the amount of returning experience, because that truly is like a, a detailing thing like that based on how we saw Nebraska play defensively on all of the, all of the downs. Like I think we can all agree. Like it was a pretty high level, perhaps a shockingly mm-hmm. high level for a year one scenario. And you just had uh, you you, you kind of got beat on on third down a little bit too often, but the point is is you were putting yourself in those spots uh, a chance to get off the field uh, a, a little bit better execution another year in the system. You would presume that that those things would would help with that. I, you know, I just looked at CFB stats quick the, the splits on that and. I think there were about 35% against unranked opponents, 45 against ranked, which, you know, stands to reason. <laughs> but <laughs> the better teams you play are better um, overall. But it kind of indicates to me, like, hey, maybe there were times where this defensive group w- with an- another year older maybe wins a couple more of just those those one-on-one matchups. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you mentioned like the ranked opponents, teams like Michigan just ritually slayed people on third down offensively and offensively and defensively. I think we've talked about this before. It's almost like, and and we've clowned on this before where, you know, going into the fourth quarter, everybody holds up the four. Like, oh, (laughs) look out. (laughs) They know it's the fourth quarter. The other team doesn't look out, you know, kind of ridiculous. I feel a little bit the same way about situational football where it's like, we got to get better at third downs. You're like, yeah, but that's just kind of being better at football, period. Like, how do you – I don't understand how you practice, like, third down well, versus it's, it's, another down. It's, it's still an, a football play. You <laughs> practice by not sucking on first and no. second down, so it's third and nine. I mean, you know, it, how, do, how do you practice that? It's still a football play. You still got to make the ta- – to me, that's a little bit more coaching, like making the right calls and putting the guys in the right positions more than it is the players somehow being better on mm-hmm. third down. I don't know where you guys stand on that. I, I think it is a little bit. I think it's probably a lot coaching. And, I mean, I think Tony White, when talking about, you know, the third down at times um, – is probably, you know, he's probably asked about it or he's looking for, you know, something to point to practically from their perspective. I, I'm guessing they're closer to you, Mark. Like we just got to be better at football generally. And, and the third down should take care of itself. Yeah. That said, you know, I think you do look at, Hey, did we get, do we get out schemed a couple of times uh, on these third downs? Um, you know, that's a coaching thing. I think another part of it is, is just uh, kind of where I was trying to, to get to was 
with more experience, um, more time, strength and conditioning, just more time with the coaching staff. Like, you know, we mentioned a guy like Jamari Butler or, or pick a guy, Tommy Hill, um, I, I think is a great example of pretty good. Like you'd expect him to be a little bit better just with a, with another year. Mm-hmm. And you get in those third down situations. I mean, Michigan was just like, they were, they were outright rude to teams all year on third down. They're just like, we could throw it here, but we're just going to, we're just going to run it again and see if you, see if you can do anything about it. Um, outright if you're, if you're Michigan, rude. Yeah, and, and they really were. Um, but, but a lot of times, you know, you get in that, third and six it, it it becomes just truly individual i think um well almost like if a team's gonna probably run the best route they have to get their best receiver open the ball's probably gonna go there and it's just like are you there to are you there to stop it and yeah maybe you can do some some stuff about that scheme wise but a lot of those those just come down to either your cornerback or safety was there or he wasn't and and one thing that for some reason i don't know why michigan's brought up multiple times here this morning on this show. We've gotten the comment in from Jelly as well. They got mashed by Michigan. That needs to improve up front. Like, comparing Nebraska's performance against Michigan <clears throat> is like comparing Kansas in 1995 to Nebraska. Like, at Kansas some point, was top 10 in 95. Sorry, no, 94, <laughs> 97. I wasn't alive, okay? Damn, I thought I was making a good comparison. But you get what I'm saying. Like, as of right Find, now... Find, replace Kansas for Iowa State. And you're, sure. You're okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay. No, I'm not sorry, dude. <laughs> no, I just that that '95 KU team. I just picked the worst one, one as a special oh, place no. because they they won in Boulder. They absolutely destroyed Colorado in Colorado. It was hilarious. And then they finished number ten in the country, and then Nebraska had four top 10 wins that year. And I think two or three of them were on the road. They went and dismantled. So I will KU pre- was good. That's why we have Glenn Mason on Glenn for big 10 purposes. Right. We, we love talking with Glenn kicked ass at Kansas and they, they made, you know, they didn't made a mistake and, and let him walk. I mean, mm-hmm. so the, there's two years. So you don't right. jack around with Kansas football. I, I tried with to- Mount Mangino's number two or three or four <laughs> finish, right. The orange bowl year. And in, in 95, uh, I, I, Jayhawk fan will find you. I tried to pick the punching bag of the Big 12, so that's on me. But Walter <laughs> kind of puts my point like into better words. Michigan had 18 guys at the Combine. Nebraska had zero. Yes. That's what I'm saying of like, you can't be comparing Nebraska to Michigan at this point in time in the Matt Rule rebuild because Michigan kicked the hell out of everybody this year. Like, they yeah. absolutely mashed everybody up front. There's a reason yeah. they went on to win the national title. Like, yeah. Like, that's not the comparison to make right now. I think, like, as much as you don't want to say it, how did Nebraska's line of scrimmage perform against Purdue, against Wisconsin, against Whoa. Iowa, against the Big Ten West? Like, yeah. where they were better, just because you don't have a comparison to Michigan. Michigan was a bad NFL team this year. Yeah, that's fair. Vogues, before we get you out, brother, let's um, get a thought on Nebraska basketball and how uh, how you feel tomorrow for some brunch ball. Uh, a bit of a, a bit of a weird time slot there, but I guess get used to, get used to weird time slots where we're in that, that time, uh, of, of March where that's going to be the case. Like I, I would expect Nebraska to go and it's, it's tough because we've seen how things can look on the road, but they played really well of late. I would expect them to, to kind of take care of business here against Michigan and, and go into, go into a big 10 tournament with, with a little bit of momentum here. Well, maybe even more than a little bit. And on the other side, uh, the Nebraska women later today uh, are the highest, highest seeded team left in their half of the bracket. Um, mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks to Maryland knocking off Ohio state. So things are, things are going to be interesting over there today. That'll be good. Did you ever get to state tournament? Uh, tur- did you get to, to championship Saturday in your high school career in Hemingford, or did you ever make it to the um, NAIA basketball tournament? And I asked this because you played college and you played high school. I was, I'm a little, little uh, reminiscence here by Vogues and his basketball travels yeah no, you're, you're a point guard you're a point guard brother 
Yeah, no, no postseason for me. Thanks for bringing that up. Oh, um, <laughs> I didn't mean. Was there something you could have done gone differently? <laughs> could have gone one or two ways. <laughs> if, if we if we'd been a little bit better situationally, um, you yeah. know, our our, our 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 inbound our inbound place t- turned out to be our Achilles heel. You know, and you, you don't think you have many of those, but uh, they, they become really important. No, Folks, but who- the closest we came my my senior year. Uh, we were we were a 21 te- 21 team and and got knocked oh, wow. off in uh in the sub district final so um, yeah so no was, I, was, I can't speak from experience on on anything that I'm talking about generally. was there any uh, any weird any weird uh, lines that week out in out in the panhandle and I asked that because you know there's been a lot of smoke around Temple this week <laughs> how does a 21 <laughs> team get knocked down in uh in, in sub districts uh, you know, teammate or two you 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 still don't speak with speak with well that, that's what makes <laughs> going and winning in march so difficult is it's one off if you have a bad shooting performance that's it that's yeah. curtains it can be as simple as that and then that's pretty much what it was that game was delayed a couple of days if i'm remembering correctly due to snow like one of my teammates who lived 20 miles from our school like had to get to the highway via snowmobile um so wow it was yeah it was a little uh outside of outside of the normal rhythm that you would expect for a game but you know as 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 coaches say conditions were the same for for both teams and uh yeah. didn't get it done <laughs> yeah is there anything you maybe wish you would have done differently to lead your team to, to glory or <laughs> played better? Um, <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Vogue's is never coming back. We're just <laughs> piling on him. Uh, Brandon Vogel, counter read, counter read.com. Vogue's what is happening with counter read. Tell us about how folks can get signed up and what you and Aaron do. Each week. Yeah, you can head to counterread.com to, to check that out. It's twice weekly Substack from myself and Aaron Sorensen. So um, really enjoying kind of the timing and frequency of that. Like there's there's always a lot of Husker news, but I've found that this kind of timing allows us to, to step back and I think really think a, a little bit more deeply about the things we choose to write about. And, and hopefully that, that comes across in, in what people are reading. Um, you can sign up. Uh, paid subscribers get those two exclusive newsletters a week. We also do a couple of free things that you can just check out at, at counterread.com anytime you'd like. Um, so yeah, we'd love to love to have people over there. Um, we're continuing to to grow this since we started in in August, and excited for postseason basketball and, and the start of uh, start of spring football. Hoping uh, we can continue to get more people in the boat. Well. Uh, find that boat, be a part of it with Vogues and Aaron counter read counter read.com. Brandon, thanks for jumping on and sorry about the, uh, the beating uh, uh, with uh, sub districts and state basketball. And that's how we ended my friend. So we'll, we'll be a little bit brighter and cheerier next Saturday. Yeah. I'm going to go get some shots up. See if, uh, <laughs> see if that changes anything, even though I know it's, it's, it's far too late. And if that doesn't change anything, Vogue's... get some shots down. If you get what I'm saying. Yes. <laughs> Vogue just headed to, headed to the driveway or the bar. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> Brandon, that's, we that's appreciate you, man. Thank you. There yeah. he is. And, uh, we welcome in the iron horse, what? dude. He found, he found a working yeah. connection Whoa, to join us. We love Gary, him. Is is he's we, in the Sioux? He's in, he's in from the Sioux Falls region. We had already yeah, prepared you, ourselves you, mentally for you not to appear when Elijah made that announcement. It's just like, oh, I, I know my schedule. My schedule got turned around, and uh, fortunately, I found a, a coffee shop here in Sioux Falls. It yeah. looks like it. we were wondering. So I'm like, I'm game. like in the, I'm mean, like in the way back. Like I'm away from everybody else, so I'm sure that there'll be a manager that'll come here momentarily and just stare at. Sure, me. Can we, uh, we can were we, wondering. Can we fill you up. <laughs> we were wondering if maybe you had spent too late a night at the Hooters with Black Hills Brandon on his bachelor party. Your good friend ba- uh, Brandon joined the yeah. show yesterday. He was in Sioux Falls. We were doing the the connections. Maybe you guys had a wild night at the Hooters. You never know. Uh, no, not at the Hooters, but I did go to the uh, Drunken Monk last night. Hmm. Which is in uh, very, very nice downtown Sioux Falls. Right. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's surprisingly, good. right? Like, yeah. Well, yeah. it's, you know, um, it's, it's the home of uh, two and a half kids per family with white picket fences, and you work at a credit card company or a healthcare facility. Two yeah, and a half yeah, kids. You do not work. 
You're, you're not yeah, wrong. Little kids uh, walking around with no torsos. It's weird. Yeah, Elijah, I'll draw. I'll draw you a diagram later. <laughs> uh-huh. but, which, uh, which, which half of they lost is my question. <laughs> it's like this a little weird. <laughs> Sioux, uh, Sioux Falls, good town, really good town. Uh, and uh, both my college roommates were from there. They still live there. Uh, I've spoken with one. I catch up with him quite a bit. The other, I don't know if he's. Uh, uh, divorced again or not i have no clue but again. um again okay oh dude dude's got the hat trick going <laughs> oh jeez. already not, not that there's anything wrong with that no no, no that's yeah. fine he he moved on her loss uh, <laughs> all of hers well, yeah well all right let's assess it's all of their losses with no background uh-huh all 10 of so, them I'm just imagining. Sharpie, I'm just imagining some no. poor guy seeing like, oh hey, is that Schmitty, my old college roommate? Let's see what he's talking. I didn't realize he was still on the radio. I wonder what they're talking about this morning. And then clicking on our show, and being like, oh. <laughs> he hasn't picked up the phone. It's okay. His folks are great. Now I want to ask you uh, a lot of things. Let's just we'll get to football in a minute. We'll talk hoops. But are you nobody, surprised nobody, about? No, by the way, nobody's talking football. That's a credit to Fred Hoiberg. Oh. It is. That's true. Yeah. yeah, we you're tried. forcing football. I was quite the, honestly, if you're trying to talk it, I was at the state tournament the other day for basketball and somebody said, hey, I was listening this morning and I heard your uh, discussion about because um, I posed, would there be more of a sign of growth with this team if they were if they were winning games where they came from behind or if they were winning games by holding on to a lead? And it was a really good conversation. This guy stopped me and he said, hey, he goes, hey, I, I, right now I don't want any football talk. He goes, it's all basketball. He goes, love you, but it's all basketball. And I'm like, mm. that's Fred Hoiberg has accomplished something that is not easy to do around here. Now, granted, spring football is what three weeks away or two weeks away now. Yeah. Um, mm. But still, I mean, we're talking basketball. Yeah, yeah. But I, I wouldn't say that the casual fan can name many players outside of Kase, right? That they haven't uh, achieved yeah. that status yet. The casual they, fan, the casual. They, they, with a do rag, JB Smoove is very recognizable, otherwise known as Juwan Gary. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. You don't you don't Juwan. think outside of Tominaga, the casual fan? The casual I think this, fan. I think the casual watches, fan knows Alec because of the hair. Rink Mask because he's a sixty year old YMCA guy playing in the Big Ten. Well, I guess define yeah. define casual fan mark. Is this somebody who does not watch the games, but maybe sees the score? Twice a gun paper? twice a year. Thank you. Okay, because I live with Double a, games a, a year. casual fan that checks the scores, doesn't watch the game, sees it's on, yeah. and goes back to his room. I live with a guy like that, and he yeah. probably only knows Kise as well. That, that's yeah, actually that's what I mean. Checks out. That's right. Uh, they, they haven't they haven't broken into like the collective. Whereas with the football team, they're perennially they, they well, always annually I mean, break they, into they, like they, the they, type of they, person hey. that calls himself a Husker fan, watches football, and doesn't watch much else. Yeah. Maybe just Are, as Kise still. Uh, this is a good question because. For a, a, a part of the Nebraska football team, there's a lot of guys that are unrecognizable because they're still relatively young. Here, I got a good question for you guys. This will kick off our chat. Hey, all right. which which Husker athlete is more impactful and more popular with the Japanese lineage, Shane Komine or Keisei Tominaga? I'm gonna go Keisei. Uh, being Komine. a guy who barely remembers go, Komine, the Hawaiian punch, Hawaiian punch, punch out, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, Chris coined that, by the way. Yeah, Genius. I know. It's that a great one. Finest I, work. I, had, uh, I had to throw that out there. Uh, <laughs> I would probably say Keisei with his, I mean, you, you saw the Japanese media contingent that followed him to senior day, the amount of attention he gets on social media from Japanese fans. I got to go with, with Keisei, but that's being a, a, a guy that wasn't really around for Komine, and obviously social media not being around for that time changes things as well. You don't know how into Komine the Japanese fan base would have been if there was social media at that time, but... That's why I'll go with Kese. Hmm. You're right. Tominaga, and, and listen, the storyline with, with Shane and Nebraska's ascendance to the CWS was was awesome, man. And it was impressive and important. But with Kese, I mean, there's there's an opportunity here to to, to – and there's been some national coverage for sure of, of, of Tominaga – when we look at the New York Times and, and some stories that are out there. But, I mean, March could really put him on a pedestal if Nebraska gets hot and puts a run together. They got to get in first, and I, we think they're in, and no bad loss to Michigan tomorrow, all that stuff, right? But, I mean, Kise could be really celebrated 
and highlighted by CBS, by Nance, by yeah. these big names, because, I mean, this is a storyline you don't hear a lot about. A guy, his story, Nebraska, did it, this dude leading Nebraska to their first postseason win ever. I mean, there's that factor that you can't really tackle. So I, I get what you're saying. And, I, and before I say something about Tominaga, Shane Comine to me was the most automatic victory in one of the most automatic victories mm-hmm. in the history of Nebraska athletics. So when good. he's starting on a Friday yeah. night, yeah. Nebraska has a chance to win. And there are very few athletes where you could say at quarterback, whenever he's starting, Nebraska has a chance to win. When a guy went to the mound to start on Friday night in the uh, Big 12, you were like, uh, that's a win for Nebraska. Now, I want to say something about Tominaga, and it's a great story, and he's a fascinating athlete. I mean, mm. you know, his parents, people are wondering. I got people blowing me up at the Rutgers game going, uh, does dad have like a, a, an American interest in a female? And I'm like, no, that is this his is longtime girlfriend. girlfriend. I mean, she's from North Platte, <laughs> Hannah. They've been together for a while. It's not like dad came over here, mom couldn't travel, so he's like, hey – um, you know, I'm bringing Tominaga, somebody to the gate with me. Tom, Tominaga's dad doesn't have a side piece in the U.S. Um, that he showed up at a basketball game with. Yeah. Tominaga is fascinating, and he's one of the funnest athletes to watch because he never stops. But I don't want people to confuse the popularity of Tominaga with going, man, let's put, let's put his number up on the wall at Pinnacle Bank Arena. Right, he's, exactly. He's, he's firmly in the starting five all-time of Fred Hoiberg in five years. But – in terms of being on that upper echelon of the Lou's and the Hoppins, he's not there. But no, he's, he, he, yeah. did, he did for what Fred needed ahead of adding a Greasel and a Walker and flipping the culture. Tominaga came along at the right time. And, Schmitty, everything you said about what could happen with Nebraska in the NCAA tournament, that he becomes a story, especially if they win, it's great for Nebraska. He's brought a lot of publicity to Nebraska and a lot of enjoyment to Nebraska. And you hope that that continues where – He's hitting big shots. He's one of those rare guys that you go, how did that ever, why are you, sh- wh- how did that ever go in? I mean, it's fa- nice he, shot, <laughs> he's, fasc- he's fascinating. And the three years just flew by. Does, does it change the calculus though, Gary, if Nebraska advances to the sweet 16 and Tominaga dropped 25 plus in each of those games? Does oh, he get on the wall then? <laughs> well, he's, well, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean though? He, like, there's all there's opportunity. Like, wow, there's there's opportunity. Not on the wall, but he gets in one shining moment. Okay. Well, here's That's the thing. We, we were kicking this around last night, and and I, I would say, should Nebraska win a round of 64 game in the NCAA tournament this year, there might be no better candidate in, in America to be America's darling in this year's NCAA tournament than Nebraska. With the Kase story, with the never won a game in the NCAA tournament story, should Nebraska make it to the round of 32? I don't think you can find a better candidate out there to be America's favorite team in the NCAA tournament than the Nebraska Cornhuskers. This is crazy. This is crazy talk, but it's kind of fun because we're talking about a program that's never won an NCAA tournament game hmm. yeah. that has broken your heart numerous times yeah. that we're talking like this. But Elijah, you're absolutely right. Um, because look at Northwestern when Northwestern got in the NCAA tournament and they had never won a game and all of a sudden they win a game. I remember that next morning because I believe they played on a Friday in Salt Lake City. Um, that next morning, you know, CBS does list like two hour pregame before he, they hit those 1130 games or 11 o'clock games. And Chris Collins and his team were everywhere. And that's what Nebraska would be. Plus you throw in it's Hoiberg. He did what he did at Iowa state. He's come back from two years ago. The program was rock bottom to being in the NCAA tournament and winning a game. I don't know. I, I think at this point, just getting to the tournament for only the second time since they fired Danny knee is a hell of an accomplishment. We're getting a few comments in the stream talking about Tominaga and his defense or lack thereof and him being a liability there. I've seen him turn it around a little bit towards the end of the year where, look, he's not he's not strong enough. He's, he's this, trying. Quick. He's not strong enough or big enough to be able to, like, take away somebody, right? Like, that's not him. But he can be a pest. He, he can be a guy that gets his hand in the lane. He can be a guy that gets some steals. Okay, so – right. Yeah, like, he, okay, he can, but that's not his forte. And yeah. I will I will give credit to Fred. And this is where this is where the culture flip happened, where guys in the first three years could do whatever they wanted, and Fred either he didn't have an option to sit their butt on the bench or he just let it go. You've seen this year when Kase won't play defense or has an interest in playing defense, he's sitting right next to Fred. Mm-hmm. And there are some combinations where you can't have Sam Hoyberg and Kase on the floor at the same time. That's just 
that's not good for Nebraska. Um, but but Kase sometimes gets into his feels. I will say one big thing about Kase that I'm really surprised outside of the post game in Minnesota back in December that Fred has not snapped on the officiating and the way they officiate Kase because away from the ball, that guy gets mugged. Mm-hmm. I mean, his size is one thing. He's always herky jerky and moving, but he gets abused away from the ball and he ar- hardly ever gets. Gets a call. Watch, watch tomorrow in Ann Arbor where they cut him through the lane a lot from one corner to another, and he'll always get touched or bumped. And not just like, hey, a little shoulder shrug here from a, a big man from Michigan. He gets – Rutgers was holding on to him. They would be throwing flags on Greg Schiano's team this past Sunday. But with Tominaga, they don't ever call anything. But nobody ever be a goon that comes off the bench and starts saying enough is enough or Fred just loses his mind. I'm surprised that hasn't happened yet because, man, Kese puts up with a lot when he doesn't have the ball in his hands. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll say this. He, he's quit whining or begging for calls. Like, he has changed his he personality. To, I, I dubbed yeah. him this guy's his I lose my period. mind. Yeah. yeah, I lose my mind. He, and where, Where's the call? Now he's, now he's like. Right. Yeah. Right. He's in the section. He. <laughs> he uh, he has grown up in, in that aspect, and he's had to kind of toughen up, and I applaud him for adjusting, and I applaud what, what Fred's done for adjusting. And I just – if you're a Nebraska basketball fan, I hope they come out and are ready to go. We, were, we had a chance to chat with Bo Reed yesterday, and he's just – he's on it, man, either from a physicality standpoint or just a, a standpoint of – how things are officiated, it matters. And and you've, yeah. you've kind of touched on it with that, but I just hope Nebraska's locked in moving forward. I hope they enjoy this. They've, they've earned it. They deserve it. And I hope they have a strong finish to the year. So we can get the popcorn here for, for two weeks. Cause this has been a fascinating team. Well, Hoiberg, Gary- Hoiberg, Hoiberg's coach of the year, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. In the conference. Because yeah. Ben, ben Johnson's had a really good year, yeah. but Fred, they were preseason 12th, and they could be as high as third. That's yeah. coach of the year, no doubt. Yeah. Now, in a tournament setting, in a tournament setting where you're facing opponents that um, aren't used to seeing you, is it an advantage to have someone like Casey? Because, he, look, it's not only his, his deep shooting ability, but we've talked about it, how he never stops moving. Almost like Doug McDermott was, right? Where it's just a yeah. – it's a – there's just not a lot of players, period, that play the game that way, <laughs> where they just yeah. are wearing you out. Is Does that help Nebraska in a tournament well, setting, maybe more so even than in a, like a conference setting where they know you? Well, let me, let me pose this to you guys. Don't you think that compared to the, the 13-14 team, that this team is better prepared regardless of the matchup to win a game? Because it's not just 30. And he's going to have to be really, really good and hit shots. But they, they have five guys, five to six guys that they can rely on, and they don't need just one or the big three. They have different options. I mean, it would be pretty amazing if they got all five going. I mean, we've seen it periodically of all five going at the same time. Beginning but of usually, Michigan. Yeah. yeah, usually it's three guys, and then there's two guys that might struggle a little bit. But there's no – like, like you can't come into the game against Nebraska and say, okay, if we take away Tominaga, we're going to be fine. I think that's the beauty of how Hoiberg constructed this roster is that one through five, they've got a chance to be, you know, to put you in a bad spot. So I think when you get to the tournament and you don't know who you're playing and they don't know you, I think that bodes well for Nebraska. Mm -hmm. You know, compared to the Big Ten where they know your personnel and especially if you're playing for the second time, they can they know what's going to you know what what your strengths and weaknesses are. Yeah. Yeah. And then even guy, even just the uniqueness of someone like rank. You know, top of the key, kind of running things like you just, you know, most teams don't have that. Most teams don't see that. Nebraska is a unique it kind of almost like back in the day with Nebraska's option offense and football. Like yeah. you just got some unique characteristics that people aren't used to seeing. Guys, question is rink mass more important as a scorer or a passer starting tomorrow and for the rest of the season? He has got to score some points. God, he, that's a great question it's because because they run him in that they run him in the high post offense where mm-hmm. he gets at that size he gets to look over the defense and lets to survey the floor and he's good if at you, it. If you if you if you get him kicking out and passing that opens up points in the paint for him. 
So it's it's chicken or egg for me, man, with this. But I'm going to say points in the paint because Nebraska needs to kind of find their rhythm back from, from at the rim, and that's been a big issue on the road. They haven't scored a lot of points in the paint. They've sometimes been hot. Sometimes they've been not from three, but you're supposed to be able to score at that size at the rim, and it's not always been great. Rick needs to get back to an efficient night, don't you think? Because yeah. he's he'll he'll get rebounds, he'll get assists, and his point totals will, will get there, and he'll hit a big shot or two. But from an efficiency standpoint, if if he's six out of ten, that changes things big time for Nebraska. Well, well you know what I'll say? I don't consider myself the smartest basketball mind, but I look at what a lot of teams in the Big Ten have done late in the season against Rink Mass, and I can get a pretty good idea that what have they wanted to do? They've wanted to slow down Rink's scoring and turn him into a passer. If that makes sense, that you see the the big man stepping up a lot more with him, opening up some space in the lane. You've seen a lot more backdoor cuts from Rink Mass that he's been able to find late in the season. If I see Big Ten teams and they're maybe second time playing Nebraska, saying, "You know what we're going to do? We're going to stop him as a scorer before we stop him as a passer," I'm going to read into that. I'm going to assume that the Big Ten basketball coaches who make millions of dollars to do so are smarter than me, and I'm going to say it's probably more important to get him involved as a scorer considering that's what Big Ten teams have wanted to slow down from him late in the season. Hmm. 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 You just left left everybody dumbfounded with the genius take. It's a good take. Uh, if we if we switch to baseball real quick, we should. Why? Because I got tickets to tomorrow's game, right oh, behind nice. home plate. Yeah, right behind home plate. Make sure uh, to call, jerk. <laughs> well, listen, taking my son. Um, so, is it to avoid a sweep or to win the series? Well, uh, that's a good question. Now, I think South Alabama jumped all over Nebraska. They they trounced them yesterday. A, a little bit of payback. You remember last year, Nebraska went down there, swept them kind of out of nowhere. Um, So I think South Alabama's had this one circled for a little bit too. And they jumped all over. They jumped all over Christo, um, who eventually settled in, did okay. One of those home runs wouldn't have been a home run if, you know, the weather conditions were normal. Um, But you're you're starting, you're starting Ty Horn tomorrow um, on the Sunday. They're still, they're still playing around with that rotation right now. I mean, you had Christo go on a Friday. Now Sears is going on a Saturday. I wonder when do you think when do you think Childress settles in and figures out his one two three for Friday Saturday Sunday three weeks from now? You think conference? For yeah, the most part. I, I tell you, if if and I think Drew's going to be okay. Um, yeah, you know, you, you'd like him to start stacking more impressive outings, and he had been on that way, and they jumped on him right away yesterday. Yeah. And some days you just don't have it. But you're right, he he settled in after that. It's not like it was just I'm out after the first inning. Yeah. Um, I like I like the option for Nebraska to have a guy like Sears thrown on a Saturday in the Big mm-hmm. Ten. That's a really good option. But they don't have to they don't have to decide on that third starter for a couple of more weeks. So I'm 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 okay with Rob putting guys in situations where they can go out and prove it to him. But they also don't you think Mark and and, and Schmitty and Elijah that it may be a case this year where there is no designated number three starter. Hmm. You, you can keep that open of, with based on how you're feeling. I mean, they're trying a lot of different guys. They've tried Caleb Clark. They're going to try Ty Horn tomorrow. They've tried – I want to say there's a third guy that they've tried. Have they tried Perry at that spot yet? Or Not is yet. he just Not in? Yeah. Either way. Sure. Uh, I, I mean, maybe I'll throw this out there. With how many times you've seen Timmerman in a high leverage spot, does he maybe get – uh, thrown into a midweek start to say, hey, let's see what you got in the starting spot as a true freshman. I think that could be a possibility moving forward. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Nebraska wants to get late in the season and not have a third starter, but I wouldn't be surprised if it takes well into the Big Ten slate to establish who that third guy is. I think you want to go at least into those big series at the end of, I believe, April and into early May when you have Iowa and I think Maryland in a couple weeks stretch. I think you want to have your three guys established by then, but I wouldn't be surprised if it takes – up until late March, early April, to until you finally start having a good idea of who it's going to be, and then you can get it finally hammered out by the end of April. That's that's kind of the timeline I see, because despite the fact you have a lot of candidates to that third guy, I haven't seen a guy that's wowed me yet and made me go, that's your that's your guy. Nope. Yep. Mm-mm. I mean, you, Sharpie you, will get you. you thought maybe you had that guy in Christo, and then last night you go, oh, maybe not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sharpie will get you out on this. We know you got uh, – Busy Saturday with Summit Basketball and 
UNO and all that stuff. And I want to get your take here at PBA. Uh, we have another championship Saturday. It tips off here in four minutes with uh, PBA and, and all the high school action. 9 a.m. championship game. Come on. That's terrible. And, it, it, and it's another – it's another uh, s- situation where it's Miller North and Bell West. Yeah, you know what? Uh, and so I thought. I thought you know Westside was built heartbroken. To, tough yeah, West Side. that w- that was tough, and that's a a team that uh, you know I know really well. And those guys had been a lot of those guys had been there for four years on the varsity. Mm-hmm. And you know Miller North has a DNA. They get to Pinnacle Bank Arena and they know how to make plays. I will say this: it's been an entertaining state championship. I, I don't mm-hmm. think in the Metro. It has been a great year for basketball. Um, you know, there's no there's no Hunter Salas or Chucky Hepburn or Frankie Fiddler or, or William Kyle the Third. There isn't Amari Bynum, um, and basketball in the Metro has been down. But I said the state tournament would be really good, and the state tournament has been really good from from the sportsmanship that was shown between Gretna and Millard North the other day uh, and how great a game that was to some of the other games. And then yesterday, you get to see Bellevue West, which you know this is kind of their last dance. They went 29 and 0 last year. They're 26 and 1. They've got eight seniors. They're going to have a transition to a much different looking team next year. So it's kind of like those guys want to go out on top. And then there's Millard North, who last year got beaten the final by a really, really good Bellevue West team. I think it'll be great. We've seen Carter Nelson and his athleticism mm-hmm. and how he's already guaranteed that he'll be in the halftime slam dunk competition at some Nebraska basketball game in the near future. And then we got fans, uh, parents fighting in the stands. I mean, what else could you ask for with the state basketball tournament? And, and one thing I'll say is last year, whenever you reached like the four P of Bellevue West Miller North, I was kind of sick of it. This year, I'm actually a lot more excited because now it's the rubber match. You're two and two. All right. It's for all the marbles. You may never see this again, this matchup. It's actually fun this year. It's kind of what I was rooting for last night. You know what? At this point, give me the five, the five Pete matchup of these two teams. And let's see who comes out on top. I'm excited for tonight. Yeah, like you know, Rocky, Rocky five. Hey, let me let me Mark. Mark and I are Omaha guys. Schmidt and Elijah, you're Lincoln guys. So this is the way it was yesterday was the fifth straight year that the class A semifinals have been all Metro. And Lincoln Southeast came up short against Omaha West Side. And that was an entertaining game that Southeast kept mm-hmm. battling and That's battling good. and battling. Do you think people outside of Omaha have lost interest in class A athletics on the boys side? Because football, football I think now, it's, it's all it's all Omaha. Now basketball, it's all Omaha. I, I think this. I think that there's a, a big gap, and they're working on it for football in Lincoln. Okay. Basketball's gotten better because you've seen some Lincoln teams beat Metro teams the last couple of years. They still got to get over the hump with the semis come state tournament time. And so I, I don't think it's it's a, a losing interest. I think it's getting better. I think Nebraska, I think uh, Lincoln teams are getting more competitive. And right now, uh, you have uh, from a girls' uh, basketball standpoint. I mean, Lincoln yeah. girls' basketball is elite. I mean, it's right there with Metro. But I think Omaha and Lincoln. I think Lincoln's climbing back. They're still not there, uh, but they're they're closer than they have been. Yeah, so it's, that's my thought. You know, it's uh, there is a school in Omaha that that had a quarterback uh, who has a power five offer quarterback. He he left um, to go to a different state. And so they went looking for a replacement. So where did they come? They came to Lincoln mm-hmm. and they haven't succeeded in what they were trying to do. But, you know, it's just I, I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder that um, because, you know, I, I I started my career in Lincoln you know, Seacrest Field, Prosh Activity Center, and now yes. being in Omaha where, you know, recruiting is nonstop and, and super teams are being put together. And there's some big time talent here. I just wonder if the rest of the state, and it's not just Lincoln, it's Columbus, Norfolk, North Platte. They're just like, screw class A. I could care less. You guys are talking about Elijah's super excited for a five Pete. And I'm like, eh, I'll watch something else. I just, I wonder if, I wonder if we get to that point or if we're already there. I'll, I'll, I think from, I, th- I think you've been there for a while. I think it's I think it's swinging. Sw- I think it's going to swing back the other way because Lincoln's. I don't got a race. I I don't. No, you have two new high schools opening in Lincoln, which are probably going to be on their way to Class A. And right. from my experience playing Lincoln high school sports, whenever you go up and face an Omaha school, there's a gap in the level of support 
that the Lincoln schools receive from a, a an athletic point of view when compared Great to the point. Omaha schools. There is a gap of sizable, noticeable difference between what the Omaha schools have and what the Lincoln schools have in terms of support at a district level. And maybe I'll leave it at that. But there's hmm. more of a focus on within OPS and within the, the Millard Public Schools on what the 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 athletic competition level is at whenever you compare it to Lincoln. And Lincoln's got great this support for other fair. things that Omaha doesn't have. A lot of great support for things that aren't athletic competition that LPS has in terms of how they're divvying up their resources. But Omaha is going to be on top because of that support that they receive. Look, the, the club and the training scene are ahead in Omaha. And I can it's see not. Lincoln catching up. Lincoln can catch up. But, but that's the only way they're going to do it. It's the only way they're going to do it. The, the top end teams in in Omaha, they're all training at the same facilities. They're all getting pushed by each other, right? And then if you look at other sports, there's, I mean, the club scenes and the facilities for volleyball, basketball, you name it, baseball, even. God, there's there, there's probably four places in town, four or five places in town where you can take indoor cuts, and they are all packed all the time, yep. <laughs> right? And, like all the time. I'll just throw this out there. I know we have to get Gary out. And I am not the the authority on this, and I don't want to speak on things I don't truly know, but my read is that that within Lincoln, there's more of a focus on making sure all of the Lincoln schools are equal as opposed to the fact that the Lincoln schools are equal with the Omaha schools in terms of support. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. You, I, I don't no, you, you I, nailed no, that, that's, I, I don't that's want to speak on things I don't you're, truly you're know what the read you get. Yeah, you're, you're, no, there, there, there are you're schools that there are schools that have wanted to upgrade their facilities because they have a generous donor yep that have been shot shot down and and they're like sure but you got to donate to everybody and that mindset's got a socialism versus capitalism is what we're talking about here well there's another there's another thing this is a this is a great topic um there's another thing in omaha where the decision by then the superintendent not to have fall sports in the fall of 2020 changed the landscape of sports in this community and they'll never get that back. I mean, you Blew also had you also had yesterday, guys. Well, I mean, we we all remember the great run of the Omaha Central Boys Basketball Program. Yeah, yesterday was the first time in five years an OPS team was playing on Friday at PBA. Last year there wasn't even an OPS Boys Basketball team in the state yeah. tournament. But that decision in the fall of 2020, which you know changed so many people's lives. It really, really just tore apart OPS athletics, and they've never recovered. And so you've got you've got a prime OPS football program that produces Division One talent that's sending guys to Lincoln. They got fleeced in this off season of recruiting. I mean, they got some big time players that are going elsewhere because it's mm-hmm. OPS athletics, and that's really a shame because there's some great people that are teaching, administering, and coaching in OPS and that decision in the fall of 2020 is still pretty prominent four years later. You just couldn't have said it any better. And, and yeah. that, that the ripple effects, right? Yep. I mean, Sharpie, we'll uh, check in with you, bud, a uh, week from today and uh, getting close to uh, uh, Selection Sunday, man. Can't yep. wait for it with the tournament. Excited for you. Enjoy Sioux Falls. Get to that Thank last you. standing Abercrombie and Fitch later. <laughs> <laughs> Does it still smell the same as it did when I was in middle school? Does it still have that distinctive? I, it might, scent? but I, I know 20 years ago when I lived in Madison, South Dakota, and I was done with my basketball, I'd make a beeline down to, to the Empire Mall. Mm. And, uh, yes. And, and uh, walk in. Hoping to see uh, Mrs. Uh, Betty Draper. <laughs> uh, hey, well, hey, I appreciate it, guys. Hey, enjoy the basketball. Next week we'll talk, and, uh, you know, maybe Nebraska's playing in the semifinals of the Big Ten tournament. Nebraska women today. That's huge. That's huge. We could, have, we could have Nebraska, Iowa again tomorrow in Minneapolis for the Big, 12, or the Big Ten women's uh, championship. Hmm. That'll be big, man. Mm-hmm. Sharp, appreciate you, brother. Thanks, hey, man. Thanks, guys, as always. Thanks, Gary. 
Gary Sharp, the Iron Horse, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal. Find us on podcast. How about Gary making it in on a Saturday morning? Shout out to him. I know. He knows. He just, he's awesome. He knows. Uh, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play is where you can find the podcast. Subscribe and like the Hale Varsity YouTube channel, KFOR Facebook and Twitter on Saturday mornings. Cranach, uh, basketball, make that baseball tomorrow. So yeah. Good for you. That's right. Elijah, you've got uh, some – so are you doing brunch ball tomorrow? Are you going to watch Nebraska, have a red beer, and check things out I got a, at I got 11 a, o'clock? I got a full day of sports. So t- tonight, you and I have the Class A state title game. I think yes. you're, I think you're still going to have me, so thank you for that. I don't think the plan – No, you're great. awesome. You'll be good. Uh, 615, KFOR. So we'll be down there. And then I'm going to make it back to my house tonight where we have UFC 299. We have Cheeto Vera against Sugar Sean O'Malley. That should be fun. I'm not sure if you guys saw also yesterday you had the, the Francis Ngannou and Anthony Joshua fight, which was bad for UFC, bad for MMA. Francis Ngannou got absolutely cold cocked in the second round. Uh, that was mm. not good. But we have a great showcase of MMA and UFC tonight. Tomorrow morning, I wake it up. Tottenham plays Aston Villa. Top four at implications in the Premier League. That's big at eight. <laughs> Nebraska basketball plays at 11. So you got that game. What am I going to do on a Sunday afternoon? Who knows? Up in the air. But uh, once we leave this show, I have a great roughly 24 hours of sports planned. So it doesn't get any better than that. That is really good. And thanks for the information about UFC. Had no idea. Had no idea about any of that. Uh, uh, Liverpool's tomorrow too, right? Don't they play Man U? Is that right? Or um... uh, That is tomorrow morning. Yeah, because last yeah. weekend we had the Manchester Derby with Man City, Man U. And then tomorrow you got Liverpool. So yeah, t- yeah. Tottenham, not, it's a sleeper game. It's a bit of a sleeper game. Astonville doesn't have the name appeal, but they've been having a great year. They're top four right yeah. now. So Tottenham wins that. They put themselves in great, great place for the Champions League next year. And Schmidt wants to end this stream right now as we get into <laughs> soccer. And a weekly tradition. We, we no, I, I, I'm excited soccer. to hang out. Appreciate you fellas. And yeah, I, I need to head out. We have uh, a, uh, a, a dog that lost it downstairs. So it's time to clean. Ooh, yeah. That's mm. fun. Mm. That is fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Then puppy that for note. sale. Puppy yeah. for sale. Drop a deuce on the carpet. Thanks, puppy. Appreciate it. No, it wasn't even the carpet. Uh, no. That's a little bit easier. It was uh, in his kennel. Oh, sweet. So my, 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 lovely, my lovely wife is up here screaming at me uh, while I'm trying to do a show. Uh, does, she want, well. uh, does she want to hop on the air? Whose idea was it to get the puppy, though? That was my birthday gift. It was her idea. Oh, okay. So she kind of only has herself to blame. I mean, a little little bit. (laughs) No, but it it might want a reminder of that right now. Like, this isn't your fault. Craynak wants you to know that I know (laughs) that you only have yourself to blame for that goddamn dog downstairs. (laughs) It was her gift idea. You were just. Yeah, it's your gift idea. Yeah. Well, yep, that is how the show ends, Tuck. That's how the show ends, talking some S. Uh-huh. All right. Well, good luck pulling that uh, poop off of that fur there, Chris. I hope that goes well for you. Oh, there's a blanket, too. So, <laughs> Smitty, appreciate you. You can hear us on the Class A state title game. If you're not going to make it down to Lincoln but you want to listen, you can stream it online uh, hey. through KFOR, yep. locally here in Lincoln, but KFORnow.com. You can stream that game across the state or care for our social media pages so i'm going to give ourselves a free shout out if you're listening across the state you want to hear the game you like schmitty and myself kfornow.com is the place where you can live stream that game beginning at 6 15 so there's our free shout out to end the show for ourselves we'll go. be yeah be on a little before that all good and uh yep it's going to be Miller north bell west ding 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 uh, round Again. five for these yep. it'll be all good Yep. So appreciate you. Check the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Hail Varsity, YouTube. Cranack will check in with you again, bud. Thank you. Godspeed, sir. All right, y'all. YG, take care. Thanks again.